What's up, bangers? Welcome back to the Banger Hanger for the brand new version of your favorite show from Banger TV. This is Lock Horns Redux. Not live, but in some comfy chairs, sitting down and discussing, debating, and locking horns around all things metal. Yeah! Subscribe, contribute to Patreon. Please help us continue to build uh, this great online heavy metal community that, that reaches across the world. Today on Lockhorn's Redux, we are digging into one of my favorite subjects. For those of you that happen to see any of my Overkill reviews, you know that I like to talk about the sound of metal, the production, the balance, the mix, the sound of the different instruments, all of that really fun, nerdy stuff. And to help me through all of this, to my left, I have Siegfried Meyer. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Siegfried, if you don't know already, is a producer, mixer, mastering engineer. He's worked with some great uh, metal bands, including Wood of Ypres, one of my uh, favorite Canadian metal bands to come out in a long time, uh, Kitty. Uh, baptized in blood and others. And to my right, we have Eric Ratz. Good to meet you, Sam. Yeah, good to meet you, Eric. Thanks for doing this. Eric is a producer, engineer, and mixer who's worked with uh, Billy Talent, Cancer Bats, uh, Danko Jones, and he just revealed to me before we went on camera, Sacrifice, which gives me uh, a, lo a lot of excuse to talk about Sacrifice which doesn't take much, but <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, thanks for doing this um, with us. I mean, I mean, yeah, just to get the conversation, Siegfried, we're gonna get into the weeds here on mm. the sound of metal, the sound of hard rock. Uh, I guess it's kind of a big question, but what what excites you about the sound of, of, of heavy music? I mean, that is a big question. Why? Um, I think it's mostly just the energy. Mm -hmm. um, the sheer, you know, shearing sound of guitars and yeah. mid, the mid range, it's you know, yeah. the, the bottom end, it's just uh, the excitement. Uh, it, that's a really hard question. It is a hard you question know, because, uh, but it's it's it, a good answer. The tempo of a song, yeah. even just, you know, it just it gets your heart just pumping. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, and of course, chords coming together. You right. Know, just. Uh, I mean, because you can't just have chug, 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 chug. It's yeah. it, the the melody and all the stuff that comes together with it is. Is really the that's all the excitement. Yeah, you know? cool. So, yeah. For you, Eric, what gets you excited about you know getting into the studio and working with the sound of, of heavy music? Guitars. Yeah. Always guitars. Guitars, right. drums. Uh, you know they got to punch you in the face, and I love that. It's when I was growing up, I loved music that punched me in the face. Yeah. And um, I, I found like heavy metal. Like I'm I'm a little older, so uh, I grew up with like uh, the Anthraxes and the uh, Iron Maidens and the Judas Priest, yeah. Van Halen was one of my favorite bands yeah. growing up. And uh, I found that their music punched me in the face. We have to talk about Ted Templeman. Yes. I realized Amazing I don't think he's anywhere producer. in my notes. Okay, yeah, we're gonna talk about. So, uh, um, uh, yeah, tell me how did, a little bit of the origin story, how did you get into actually producing? Well, I wanted to make a free record for my band. Like anyone else in the music business, you yeah. start out in a band. Yeah. So I wanted to make a free record for my band and I uh, went to school for it and luckily got a job at a recording studio yeah. uh, called Phase One in Scarborough. Oh yeah, Phase One. And they, uh, Garth Richardson came out of there, Randy Staub, who uh, produced, or sorry, who mixed uh, the Black Album, a yeah. bunch of other great heavy records, Motley Crue, stuff yeah. like that. They all, they all worked out of there. So They're working on a Triumph documentary. They did their first yes. records there before they built Metalworks. It's which true, they, they, learned, yeah. they were signed to a production deal with, yeah. uh, with, with Paul Gross and Doug yeah. Hill, and yeah. who, uh, Ran phase one. Or cool. Phase cool. Phase Some one. good yeah. uh, Canadian rock and metal uh, pedigree in yeah. the room for you, Sig. How did mm. you get in? How did you get into it? Definitely not as cool as that. <laughs> um, I always tinkered. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, back in back, I was born in Germany. So um, my parents, my dad gave me a tape recorder at like two to keep myself occupied while they locked me in a room yeah. because they were working the farm. So okay. I was the youngest of four. Yeah. I know it sounds terrible now, you don't lock kids in a room, but <laughs> if you don't want them to die, it's probably a better place for them to be than you know, right playing with yard. farm machinery. Exactly right. <laughs> in fact, my brother lost half of his thumb exactly in that situation. So, right. so I think tinkering with like you know music, electronics, and recording music off the radio 
was always something I enjoyed doing. And, and Eric doing shared that. some of his early music inspirations. What were what were some of the early metal or otherwise well, that kind of got you interested in how things We moved sounded. here in 83, and oh, to me that okay. was like a pinnacle. I was five, so, yep. um, but I had never heard of any westernized music before then. You know, okay. a lot of people grow up with it at a very young age, yep. but I came here and the first three songs and videos I actually got to see were Michael Jackson's Thriller, yeah. Cyndi Lauper's Girls Just Wanna Have Fun, yep. and Van Halen's Jump. Right. You know, both of those were giant in like the spring of 83 yep. when we came. So, um, and Thriller used to scare the shit out of me. Mm -hmm. I used to hide under the bed, but I loved it. It was so exciting. Yeah. You know, so, but, I mean, even the Thrillers, it, to me, is still like, that's a heavy record still. Like, yep. even though it's not metal, but it's like, you know, Bruce Woodin, like, It's an know, amazing genius, sounding like, record. It yep. is, absolutely. Yep. And Quincy Jones, obviously, like, yeah. The whole thing is like fa fantastic, yeah. right? So, but obviously Van Halen being what it is, but, yeah. but I think just growing up, my older brothers were into a lot of metal bands, you know, uh, yeah. but they hadn't heard of, of stuff either before then, yeah. you know. But I also love Top Forty Radio, yeah. you know. So I got like my Madonnas, and sure. of course I loved Falco, if you remember Falco, yeah, of course. you know, because he was Austrian slash German, yeah, you know. Yeah. So that was that was always exciting to me because it was like a little piece of my home, yeah. But I could have yeah. it here because it was giant on radio in like '86. Yeah. You know? Very cool. Yeah. I have an eight-year-old son who's taken a quite a strong interest in music, and he's on a huge Beatles binge right now. Mm. So I've been listening to the Sound of the Beatles records. But and again, another temp temp Ted Templeman drop. I didn't realize how like I loved 1984 mm. as a kid. I remember when it came out, and I've been listening to that record a lot. And man, some great. That's a great sound on yep. that record. It is. It really it's a is. Great yep. sound on that record. It's really game amazing. changer. Yeah. Big yeah. time. For anyway, that, for that time. Was, anyway. For that yeah. time. Yeah. The, yeah the, just the way the guitars sit with this, all the synth stuff and the drums. My son is a drummer, and so he's like obsessing over Alex Van Halen. And man, those drums sound so amazing. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't think they were doing any synth stuff before that record, were they? No, if anything, not really. Very no. minimal no. sort of backgroundy yeah. stuff, but but it was very in the forefront. Well, yeah, it was know. literally one guitar yep. with the reverb on. If you listen <laughs> to Van Halen one, one yep. guitar reverb on the side. I used to do side. that. I used to pan it's, it left so I could amazing. hear just the bass. Just pan amazing. it right so I could hear just the amazing. guitar. It's Basically, we're record. just going to redirect yeah. this entire show to Van Halen for a moment. <laughs> Dancing uh, in the Street, I, they actually uh, had some synth on, which was yep. on Diver Down. Mm, yep. But yep. Uh, anyway, uh, let's shift the conversation. Um, Eric, um, what's the role of a music producer in your mind? Uh, these days, uh, social worker, um, <laughs> nanny, yeah. uh, decision maker, yeah, and um, that's pretty much it. Uh, and you know, basically, you have to encompass a bunch of things mm -hmm. to to see a project from start to finish. Right, and, and it's it, it it can be challenging depending on uh, the the band's um, how much experience a band has. Sure, because I find the bands with uh, the least experience, it's more of a teaching yeah. gig. Mm -hmm. The bands with experience, it's more of a social worker gig. Yeah. You know? Well, we'll get to this later, but actually pre preparing for today, thinking about all the metal producers that I like and have listened to over the years, what also dawned on me, and this is kind of connected to what you're saying, is we forget how active metal bands themselves have been in the making of oh, their, yeah. their, their records, right? So to your point, I guess it depends on the level of involvement or interest the band has in the sound itself, yes. right? Mm -hmm. And um, usually there's a big picture going in, like especially with metal. Mm -hmm. Like you can, you can kind of only take it, not, I, not saying that there's, it's a narrow window, you know, um, but, yeah. but usually the band, especially the established bands, they already have a fan base, they already have a sound, yeah, uh, that they that they developed over the years. Yeah, and basically uh, what you're trying to do in from a production standpoint is just uh, you know keep that fan base, maybe grow the fan base a bit more, and put out a record that everyone's gonna love. Right. But you make an interesting point. The role of the producer is not just about oh we need a bit more treble. Oh no, mm. that's, that's on this. Yeah, that's yeah. not. How about for you, Sig? What's what's the role of the of the producer? I equate a lot of this in music making and production to like like building a home or building. Mm. My dad was was a builder and you know he did stuff. So I've always sort of thought of it that way. So pr production to me is like being like the contractor of a gig. Yeah. You know, so you're the one in charge of 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 the budgets, the scheduling, of hiring the right people to do the job, and you know just just getting it done. And everyone sort of relies upon you and. Yeah, stay relaxed, and uh, so, so much of it is the social aspect too. Like you're talking about, like you're a therapist, you know. Mm -hmm. um, 
the way we do stuff at our studio is like, I got bands that live there. Like we've got a separate home, so I get to be even control them a little bit more. <laughs> Poor guy. And I love it. You know, like it's. I want them to be there with me because it becomes such a personalized experience. And yeah. I got people like 10, 15 years later that like talk to me and tell me that the two weeks they spent with me were the best time in their life. Right. You know. Not the birth of their child or their <laughs> marriage or, you know. It was the like, birth of the album. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, yeah. and I'm like, that really warms my heart because it makes me feel like I actually did something that mattered in their life. Well, you this know, is so. interesting because I think there's a certain romantic archetype of the music producer as this mm. person, usually a dude mm. with his, you know, feet kicked up on the mixer, <laughs> just ba la basically saying what I said before, uh, a little more treble yeah. on the bass, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and clearly, the role, maybe it's evolved to be something bigger than it used to be, or do you think it's always been that way? I think maybe, maybe kind of smaller almost than it used to be, because I mean, a producer mm. back in the old days, like you didn't touch gear, you know? If you're talking about the unionized time of, oh, yeah, of right. engineers with lab coats and you weren't allowed to, it was, yeah. you were the song guy, so you worked on you know, finding a, a song for the, the artist that worked, and you, know, you worked on performances and, and budgeting and mm -hmm. you, know, li you know, that kind of stuff, very admin stuff almost in a sense, like a contractor right. has to take care of shit. And, and if something goes down, you're the one that's responsible for it going down, right. you know? So, yeah. yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's the, old, the old story. If it's a hit, th it was the yeah. band. If it sucked, the producer did <laughs> yeah. a terrible job, exactly. you know? So we can't win a, either way, but. Um, kind of like being a sports coach. Pretty much, pretty <laughs> yeah. much, yeah, you, totally, know? Yeah. you know? Fire yeah. the guy, fi fire the guy if they don't make the playoffs. <laughs> If they win the cup, the team was fantastic. That's right. Yeah, it's all know? about the captain yeah. and the goalie. So it's, yeah, it's yeah. kind of the same way in uh, in, in production, uh, music production. Uh, we kind of no, we don't get the short end of the stick, but it's like sometimes uh, sometimes all the things we have to manage over the mm -hmm. course of a project can get overlooked or or uh, just not appreciated. Maybe, yeah, is, sure. Use lack of a better term. You know, for a while now, we've had an idea at Banger, which I hope one day we'll get off the ground. Um, and uh, we, we'd, love, we'd love to do a series about the big music producers of all time, mm -hmm. you know, and do a great documentary series where each episode mm -hmm. is about a, a big producer. Um, maybe one day we'll get to do it. I think what we're hitting on here, which I think is really interesting is, we started to look at like, you know, we started thinking of the all-time great producers of George Martins mm -hmm. and the Daniel Lanois and the Rick Rubens and, and on and on and on, is that n no two are the same. No. There's no rule book. Nope. It's like this weird enigmatic thing. Like at least if you're playing the guitar, like you know there's a certain thing you have to learn, there's certain things you have to learn in order to play the guitar or any other instrument for that matter. With the producer, it's sort of like, there's no rule book. No. So, and, and I think the, the sorry. Yeah, the, carry on. Uh, but I, I think like you mentioned guys like Rick Rubin and stuff like that. You know, like you can look at Rick Rubin's career, Mutt Lang's career, yep. and it spans like a, a variety of different genres. And uh, to me, that's the mark of a great producer. Mm. Right. You know, like Rick Rubin can go from Beastie Boys, Slayer, Jay-Z, and yep. Mutt Lang, like def, from Def Leppard to Shania Twain, right. and have and the Cars, mm. and d and make albums that define that art, the, right. those artists' careers. So know? on that, then, I mean, this might sound as a hopelessly pretentious question, but <laughs> do you have a method? Like, do you have a process? I mean, you mentioned your part therapist, but like when it actually comes to trying to shape the sound of a record with a band, like, are there certain things you always do? Is there a certain uh, approach you take, or is it? Totally different every every totally time. Totally different every time. Okay. Hmm. Totally different, yeah. and it's and it really depends on the band. If right. like great producers, I find work with great bands. Okay. And yeah. That's you know like, uh, I'm not you know uh, taking nothing away from uh, from from uh, say Mutt Lang, but Back in Black. Yeah. I don't know, man. I'm, I'm sure my mom could have sat there and recorded. Oh, back and, you know, no, now but, we're getting no, somewhere. No, but you know what I'm saying? That's why we like, call the show Lockwood. It's it's it's, it's like. It's like the viewership he's, he's, just spiked he, there. <laughs> Mutt Lang is 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 producing an album for a band that just lost their singer. Okay, You've got a new singer, but they're already an established act. Yeah, he did Highway to Hell with them. Yeah, or Highway to Hell and Dirty Deeds, I think. Um, and uh, you know, he already had a rapport with the band. They uh, they knew what to expect going into the studio. Sure. he got the songs together ahead of time, all that stuff. It's Mutt Lang. He's obviously a whole other whole other level, but. You know, it's ACDC, 
with bringing you songs like You Shook Me All Night Long, yeah. and Back in Black, and, you know? So sh- you would have expected a little more from the sound well, of that record? No, I w- not necessarily expected a little more. I'm just saying uh, my point is uh, you can be the greatest producer in the world, but if you're working with people who don't really have talent, there's only so far you can take yeah. it. There's a lot you of know? different factors yeah, that go into making a great record and beyond just a good producer and a good but band. It's a good you band, you've got to have too. a label and you've got to have all the right timing. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, it's important that you gel with the artist too. I mean, a lot of times yeah. I'll work with people and I'll just do one song because I, I don't know the vibe that's going to come out of it. And mm-hmm. you know, if it's great, we continue a, a relationship. But if it sucks, and usually it's because I'm not really digging them, right? You know, because I don't right. want to spend a month, two months with someone that I'm not enjoying. Yeah. You know, because yeah. it's. That's important to me that I that I appreciate our relationship and, um, you know, I'm gonna look back at that time of my life and I'm gonna say I wasted two not wasted it, but I spent two months of my life. You know, was that important? Did anything come of it? Was the relationship good? Yeah. You know, regardless of the music, regardless of whatever happened. You yeah. know, so so I think there are great producers obviously that could work with anybody, but I'm sure if you if you read into any of those situations, there's probably artists that we you know relate them to that they probably hated right. or that they didn't enjoy. Okay, I want to you know? shift the conversation now because ultimately this conversation is about metal mm-hmm. and the sound of metal records. Um, for you, what are some of your favorite sounding records of all time, metal or other Oh boy, that's such a loaded question, I man, because there's so many of them. Uh, that's why I'm asking you instead of me. Well, <laughs> uh, for me, yeah. like growing up as yeah. a kid, that's when metal affected me the most. Sure. And, and uh, um, Power Slave by mm-hmm. Iron Maiden was one of was was one of the first records I really took note mm. of, of. Like this sounds something about this mm-hmm. really gets me going. You know, yep. like, there's something about that record that just sounded amazing. I could hear everything on it. Mm-hmm. It was just next level compared to even the last Iron Maiden, the sure. Iron Maiden record before it and even before that. So, or even my Judas Priest records, you know, like mm-hmm. how come Screaming for Vengeance sounds better than British Steel? Mm-hmm. You know, there's, mm-hmm. so there's certain, uh, but that Iron Maiden album for me was, was sort of the one that uh, made me pay attention, more attention to sound. Well, looking back, do you think that was something you were paying attention to a lot from a, from a young age? You were you were you you were starting to listen closely. I guess, oh to yeah, the well, records. <coughs> my my first the first the thing that actually got me into was uh, into guitars was BTO Four Wheel Drive. My dad had that record and I had this little turntable and I remember just going through these albums. There's like country albums and crap. It was all garbage. I see this like black, these these bearded, heavy dudes. Yeah. I put it on and what came out of those speakers, man, changed me forever. It yeah. literally changed me forever. Cool. It, Sig, for you, uh, so a record many. or two that I mean, stand out for you is, like as master the best. Puppets, best you yeah. know, like that oh, yeah. was, yeah, yeah that was, I mean, and even, and even the records before that they put out, were yeah. all, they were all so different, but yeah. when that came out, it was just like, and I was young, I was only like nine years old, but mm-hmm. I, even at an early age for me, I mean, I used to listen to, like the snare drum was as important as the vocal to me as a child. Mm-hmm. I, and, and I always thought that I was maybe a little bit weird and different for thinking that, but I realized as I got older why I enjoyed that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, the, the width and the, because st- I used to listen to headphones a lot. We used to have like old school stereos. Sure. And, and just hearing the spread and the, we talked about Van Halen before, the left and the right, and I would notice those things, you know. Yeah. So, um, and for the its impact. time, Master of Puppets had such a, a it, that enormous guitar tone, right? Yeah. It was insane. <coughs> Massive. Right? Yeah. That was, I was like almost like an orchestra yeah. of guitars, yeah. right? Yeah. And, I, and I don't remember, I mean, even Ride the Lightning wasn't even close to no. that. And no, no, Ride the like, Lightning what, was kind of weird sounding in comparison. Yeah, yeah. You know? And then, of course, when Andresses came out, despite the fact that there was no bass, you know, and we all know why. It Big is. problem. I'm yeah. a you know, and it, th- 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 that whole situation was like, how do you, you, know, how do you replace Cliff? You know, yeah. so no matter who the hell was going to play on that record, that shit was going down. It was turn it down because you know you can't like. Who Have knows? you heard "Injustice for Newstead"? No. I've the heard online, that. The <laughs> online. I actually mixed a version of "Black End" once because uh, I had the tracks and I cranked <laughs> the bass up. Holy! Can I can I swear on this? Fuck yeah! Holy <laughs> fuck! Is yeah. the bass amazing? No shit. The tone, the it's grind. It's amazing. He's got like an SVT you thing. You hear happening. "Black End" with bass Holy in there? Holy shit! It, wow. It changes it oh, changes the sound of that record. Excited. It's really. Pretty, even one, oh one yeah. with the bass. Oh my crank. god! It's got, like, it has all. It's got this, this. It makes this Lars gr- sound better. This grit <laughs> when the bass is up. I'm like, why did you not do that? 
you know, but I mean, fast forwarding even like, I mean, obviously Nirvana's Nevermind was, right. a, was a pinnacle record, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah. At the drive-ins, relationship of command, like mm. that record was yeah, phenomenal. Yeah, that was like, a good sounding record. You know, yeah. and then you even go to like uh, My Chemical Romance, Three Cheers. Like, mm -hmm. there's all these like eras where like all of a sudden things shifted and changed. Yep. Musically, sonically, things, and a lot of it had to do with technology, obviously, because we're we're talking sure. about two-inch tape to thirty through forty-eight digital yep. tape to you know the beginnings of Pro Tools and yep. you know and all. Well, that we'll stuff. get to that I think yeah. after we hear some what the viewers have to say because obviously. <clears throat> the tools you have at a certain period of time are going to yep. shape the sound, right? And you listen to some of those records now. And yeah. I mean, yes, Master of Puppets, for example, yes. still has that kind of super wide, super orchestral guitar sound. Yep. But you listen to it now, and it is a bit like, oh. Well, that's There's an the element of like, what were they thinking? But then you <laughs> realize it's 1986. But the young generation who's yeah. maybe getting into production right now and stuff, if they don't understand historically what yeah. happened, right. they can't appreciate it, you know? And so that's a good point. what you were saying about education to the client or to the artist, that's so much of what I do all the time. And I try to I try to educate. I've got like a bunch of different like VH1 classics, classic albums that I show people. And when people stay with us at, at our band house, I can sort of like, hey, you guys got to watch this. This is yeah. important education for you. Right. And, okay. You know? Well, uh, let's get into some of the comments mm -hmm. and then we'll pick it up because yeah. I know there's a lot of opinions with our viewers of, you know, <laughs> who the top metal producers are and, and what are the best records they've worked on. Okay, first up we've got Logan Ebison, Bob Rock, mm. uh, 1987 Whitesnake, uh, Blue Murder, <sighs> self-titled, The Cult, Sonic Temple, Motley Crue, Dr. Feelgood. If I ever were to have a producer touch an album I made, it would be Bob Rock every day. <coughs> Jeff Zakem, or Zakem says, Terry Date. Mm. Yeah. Forget how many records Terry Date worked on. Mm. Check this out. Uh, cool. Love his sound. Love the heavy uh, sound he gets from bands and the diversity to be able to jump from metal to alternative to whatever. Some huge records that end up being so pivotal so for so many bands. Um, Soundgarden, Pantera, mm. Incubus, Dream Theater, Helmet, Screaming Cherries, Slipknot, uh, and on and on. Chris Decker, his reach goes far beyond metal, but in my mind, Rick Rubin mm. is the greatest. Slayer, The Cult, Danzig, System of Down, just to name a few. Ruben, Ruben is a genius, of course. Uh, Johnny Cash yeah. mm -hmm. uh, is one that hasn't been mentioned yet. <coughs> Pretty remarkable uh, work. Josh Neufeld, I'm actually super impressed with Adam D's production with Kill Switch Engage and Serpentine Dominion. Interesting. His mm -hmm. production is super impressive, you know, for uh, modern quote unquote metal mm -hmm. uh, fans. I think, you know, Kill Switch's records uh, sound. Super strong. Uh, Jake Dickinson says Kurt Ballou has an amazing sound and mm -hmm. consistently works with various artists, especially newer bands. Albini mm -hmm. is oft forgotten in the realm of metal, but Neurosis and the Two New Sun albums definitely have him on a lot of people's radars again. Uh, Robert Bat, uh, like it or not, what Ross Robinson achieved with Korn's mm -hmm. first album and others is unmatched in metal. Honorable mention would be uh, Brendan O'Brien. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say honorable mention. He uh, should be up there. For rock sure. producer, yeah. yes, but yeah, still brought us Rage Against the Machine and Mastodon's epic uh, Crack the Sky. Yeah. I personally think Mastodon's records are some of the best sounding uh, around uh, today in, in, in Very metal. Very natural. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'll throw in some other names that aren't mentioned. Martin Birch, mm -hmm. um, Frederick Nordstrom, who worked with a lot yeah. of Swedish bands Dude that I love. Bargain. Andy yeah. Sneap, yeah. Yep. who Andy you know Sneap produced course, the latest yeah. Priest record and has worked yeah. on a on a a bucket load of, of metal albums and, you know, well, and Fleming Rasmussen, of course, yep, which we've yep. been talking about uh, with Metallica. But uh, for you, Eric, anything in there that... Uh, I agree with all that. Like, yeah. all, those, all those guys have made huge influential records in metal. Um, yep. You know, but there's also new guys coming up, like uh, Nick Rusculanek. He's, mm. he's, you know, Worked did all the... Rush. Yeah, Rush, yep. Alice in Chains. Uh, yeah. He's, you know, he's he's kind of the uh, the guy right now in America. You yeah, know? interesting. Yeah, and uh, he does a lot of heavy music. Yeah, you know, so. Sig, I mean, you can't deny that list. Yeah, it's you know, yeah. it's the credits speak for themselves. Yeah. The, the record sales, you know, sure. like I mean, it's not always about that, obviously, and and there's a, there's a lots of people that would shit on Bob Rock's work mm -hmm. because of how commercial or how much he changed the artist afterwards, and but I think most of those artists wanted to change. You know, I, I don't think I don't think a producer necessarily, you know, and that's what you were saying before about if the record does well, then you know, it's the it's the band, it's the band, the right? Stiffs, so the producer, <laughs> <stuff. laughs> producer shit <laughs> the know, bed. So, <laughs> so, but I mean, I, and, and speaking of modern stuff, I mean, the tools have made so many guys be able to do mm -hmm. amazing work these days. Sure. So sometimes it's actually hard to stand to stand apart. 
Right. You know, when everyone's got the same drum sample libraries and the same amp sims, and you mm -hmm. know, all they're doing is cutting stuff apart and timing it, and, and yeah. you know, DIs, and you know, so everyone kind of sounds a little bit the same almost, you know. Yeah. But then the, the clients, the, uh, the artist actually wants that too sometimes. Right. So I think it's a little bit of a give and take situation. That's a really good point. Like, yeah. what are the pros and cons? Do you think around the technological innovations that have happened in sound? Because mm. you know, it's true. Like. <coughs> You know, it can get pretty cookie cutter yep. sounding at times, especially in metal where there's like, you know, like it or not, there are certain parameters. Mm -hmm. There's only so far outside of a certain range of sound that you're going to go in terms of how the drums should sound, especially if there's like a lot of double bass yeah. and how the guitar should sound. I mean, so yeah, what are the pros and cons do you think of just this technology? Uh, it's, it's like it's like the never ending menu at McDonald's. Right. You know, it, it's uh, can take more time than it's worth. Right. Man, I can make a record just as good on analog tape back in the day. Yeah. Quick a uh, lot more quickly because you have to make the decision right there and then mm -hmm. it's be like, yeah. well, we'll playlist and we'll decide later. And you you know, right. you, you go later and you're like, wow, I got 400 playlists to look through. Oh, the one that's up is fine. Right. You know, and meanwhile, it maybe it was the one four back that was really good, you right. know. So I think uh, technology can if you're not careful, it can work against you. Right, it's a it bit of a myth of efficiency in it a is. way. It, I it's guess a, it's, it's not a necessarily making it better or faster or no, more No, I still do it the same way, man. If, if we have to punch chords, we're punching chords, whether it's on tape or yep. in Pro Tools, you yep. know? And, yep. and I think uh, the, the, oh, we'll decide later thing is uh, a bit of a curse. It happens in documentary, because mm -hmm. we can shoot on course, digital. Yeah. And like, yeah, you know, oh, we'll figure it out. Well, we'll leave it on the uh, cutting room yep. floor. Fix it in post, yep. as we Fix like to say. Post. Fix it in post. Never good. That's a, that's a, that's mm. a deep hole that you yes. can jump well, you know, into, right? Well, this is, this is what I'm saying. Yep. The, the digital realm becomes a giant black hole. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, th I think a lot of it has to do with budget these days too, because mm -hmm. there is far less of a budget than there ever was for mm -hmm. a lot of these smaller metal records, um, and so a lot of guys um, they don't necessarily want to take the time with the artist anymore because they're like, well, I'm only getting paid X amount of dollars. This is barely enough to cover my rent, the studio space, mm -hmm. buy a couple plugins. So I'm just going to use this, 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 and this. They're going to love it because this is their sound. I know it. So I think sadly that's what's happening right now is is the budget is dictating what the record sounds like as opposed to, right. you know, we should be spending this amount of, I'm, but I'm a big commit guy too. Like, luckily I grew up sort of in the tail end of all that, of using tape machines and, yeah. and cutting and, and, and so I like to commit, even though I use Pro Tools and I have all that stuff, and, but even I'll, I'll make notes and I'll put little dots in like a, a, an actual playlist and I'll say, that's the take right there that, I, that I'm feeling. Use masking tape? Still use masking I tape? I use any, yeah, anything like that. Like, <laughs> I, I dare like, you record in destructive mode. <laughs> I dare you, I well, dare I do you. that. I have, a, I have a radar. Gone I'm getting thrown down here. I have no idea what it is, but it sounds well, threatening. In Pro Tools, you can... You can uh, it's like tape, yeah, then. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it, in destructive mode, it's like tape. So like yeah, you go over it, and you can never get there's it There's no undo. Ah, yeah, there's no, no undo, undo, right? There's so no turn even, back. even radar has an undo level. It takes yeah, some cojones right there. But that's it. Yeah. You know, so. But it's important to commit, I think. Yeah. And you know, I mean, the space that we put together uh, you know, out in the country, um, it there's so much stuff to do, and there's tape, and there's Pro Tools, and but... I commit stuff. If, I got, if I've got six mics on a guitar cab, that's going to one track. I don't yeah. want six tracks. Yeah. I don't want something to, to corrupt the session afterwards and then I bring it up and I'm like, oh, uh, I don't, my guitar tone's lost. You yeah. know, I, I want that to be there. I never question it when I'm mixing afterwards. Did I make the right choice on that guitar tone? Right. No, I got better things to worry about at that point in time. You know? Um, is it difficult to stand out as a producer? Yes. Mm. Yeah. Because everyone's a producer now. Right. <laughs> right. So yeah. It's, so yeah, it's very difficult. And to that point, I mean, we touched on it earlier. Like, especially in metal, I don't know how this compares to other genres of music per se, but I just know it because we live and breathe metal here at Banger TV. But a lot of band, you, and you see pr producing and engineering credits, and nowadays it seems like at least half of the time the band has a production credit on it. I mean, I don't know what really that means, but yeah. I don't know. But it's hard to stand out, I guess. Is yeah, what it is. It, it, it's hard, especially with everyone having an opinion these days about for things, sure. So. Right. And and the, and because the uh, producer role has been, uh, there's so much you have to do. Uh, sometimes it dilutes your focus of being the guy who everyone comes to for what should we do now? Right. You know. Right. Let's order lunch. Oh. The problem with it's that like too that is a lot of the these, job description. Exactly. A lot of the artists have some sort of a rig at home. 
So they already know a little bit of what you're doing right. when it comes to Pro Tools. So you know, they feel like they deserve, if they've had any sort of say at all in decision making, they feel they deserve the co-production credit. And I honestly don't disagree with that. Like, the, any time an artist has any say over the final sound of a project, you know, I'll give them a co-pro. I mean, pretty much every artist to me is a co-producer. Right. You know? Right. Um, you need to write a better deal memo, man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get anything. I get paid for my gigs and I'm happy. I don't care about anything else in the long run. Because I ain't going to be here that long. Eric so Grass is offering matter. courses. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> go to <laughs> www. What to, what to include in your deal memo? <laughs> Um, no co-production yeah, credits. Yeah. Wow. No, it's no a, I it don't depends. care. I like it, to share it. it well, you know? it really, uh, I agree. I agree. It, it, it does depend too, like you might have a guy in the band who is literally, he's got the vision yeah. mm -hmm. and, and you're facilitating that yeah. for him. You yeah, know? Sure. And, and, and because he doesn't have the experience to take a record from start to finish, yeah. You're, you're sort of, you can sort of become his wingman or he becomes your wingman in the right. process. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that's, my, I guess, to my point earlier, like, there's this enigmatic quality to the music producer in the yeah. sense that, that, you know, the average music listener does not really know what a producer no. does. <laughs> and, you know, it can, you know, we've all heard the kind of these tall mythological tales mm -hmm. of like Rick Rubin showing up for five minutes and just sort of <laughs> uttering the words... Just, yes or just, no. Just give it more, <laughs> and then like leaving the room, right? To like the the what the you know to to the producer that's yeah. like you know got a do got a knob on each finger, right? Mm -hmm. And is super hands on. Uh, I guess that's what makes this this kind of like all very hard to define. I do remember interview. I got to interview Andy Wallace. Mm. Oh wow. Well, yeah. we didn't mention him before. Yeah, Clearly yeah a legend. when we when we made um, Metal Evolution. Mm -hmm. Give me your perspective on why, on what was innovative or exciting about, about Rain and Blood. At least from my perspective, it struck me as a whole lot faster and more in your face and just, you know, uh, aggressive than, uh, than anything I had heard, you know, from Metallica or mm -hmm. uh, other bands at that time. What I did do was respond really to, that, to the energy level of it and the, and the, uh, and the precision of it, mm -hmm. you know, Dave it was just Lombardo was just yeah. just magnificent on that album, and that and that album was not done with a lot of editing and, and putting together takes. I mean, they they had been playing those songs uh, live, I, I imagine, at that mm -hmm. time, and, and pretty much had them down. For me, it was an opportunity to kind of make a, a metal record, kind of the way I heard it, because a lot of the metal records that I had heard up to that point, they they never really sounded the way I felt a metal record could really sound. Mm. Uh, they tended to be a little thinner on the low end. Uh, a lot of the double kick stuff was like a typewriter, like, tick, 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 you know, you know, which has a certain thing going on, but I always felt the whole thing could just be ballsier and, you know, mm -hmm. and heavier and, and also not quite as ambient as some of the records were at that mm -hmm. time. That's what we did on that record. You know, it's, it's not a very ambient record. It's all just right in your face. But the, but the idea was to, was to have the, the listener kind of be a punching bag, mm -hmm. you know, and to have this just go pow, 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 and, and, and it did that. I mean, it's, it's relentless. No discredit to Rick Rubin, but it became pretty clear to me that he had a massive role to play in the sound of Slayer, Rain, and Blood. Oh, yeah. Which is like one of my all-time favorite albums, metal or otherwise. The sound of it for that time, it was like the opposite of like, it's funny, the two biggest thrash records of all time, arguably, that came out in the same year, 1986, Slayer, Rain, and Blood, and Metallica, Master of Puppets, yeah. mm -hmm. could not have sounded more different, yeah. which is really interesting, right? You had the orchestral guitars of Master of Puppet over here, and then you had like the super, like no reverb, yeah. direct, and Punch and that's I remember Ali Wall saying to me. He said, you know, I just wanted to feel like Lombardo's kick drum was like tapping you in the forehead. Mm -hmm. wow. And that's what right? it sounds it like. And it's amazing. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you listen to you listen to that record. I would argue that Rain and Blood is dated a bit better even yep. than say yep. Master yep. of Puppets oh, yeah, so, yeah. in a way because. Yep perhaps because of its simplicity. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I don't know what my point in all that is, but that Andy Wallace 
who was the engineer, had a massive role to play in the sound of that record. Yeah. yeah. So I'm Absolutely. sure. Well, and that's where it gets blurred a little bit because yeah. the the role of engineer slash producer. Sometimes people are credited as engineer when they're actually doing far more production. You know, but like you said, they didn't work out a good enough deal, so they didn't get the but credit. But al also, I I, I don't think engineering is production. Like it's, it's not. It's it's mm. the, the the technical technical part of production and. Yeah. Um, uh, and yes, engineers do play a, a big role in, in the, uh, the overall sound of the record, but they are also fed a big picture. Yep. And usually they're working with a producer because they get each other and the, the, yep. you, you know, the engineer knows what, to, what the producer wants. And it goes without saying yeah. that the role of the engineer depends on the role of the producer in the sense mm. of if the, if the producer is just popping in for five minutes yeah. to say, give it more, then the engineer's probably going to be the person sitting there going, mm, I think we need more kick drum here, yeah. or what do you guys think about this guitar sound? It's right? also it far far more rare these days to yeah. have those two guys be actually right. two different people. Right. Yeah. Um, it is. I haven't hired an engineer for a record. I think maybe, maybe actually the last little bit I've been getting guys to come in and sort of assist me and do things for me, maybe an engineering role, but um, there's no budget for that on my level, really, you know, well, plus... I don't want to give my money away, 86 but 86 was a, was a whole, whole different yeah. time, yeah. right? A long so time ago. 86 yeah. until 2005, I would say, actually, right. was probably when that was still sort of valid, you yep. know? But um, Yeah, okay, so we talked quite a bit about, you know, the general process of being a producer slash therapist, mm -hmm. and, and we touched on some of our favorite metal albums, but uh, Sig, maybe you could talk a bit more specifically about, like, the technical process of making a record? Because I think, again, the average music listener doesn't really know what mm. that entails. Well, and it's changed a lot over 30 years. Mm. I mean, I've been doing this for just, you know, 25-ish, you know, pretty young, but, uh, yeah. um, but I mean, to go from tape, the, that, that whole like jump from tape to Pro Tools, right. you know, was, uh, was a massive jump because all of a sudden now you, you were cutting tape, you, you were literally able to fix a person's timing. And for drums, that was the, the first big thing um, around 97 to 98, 99, that was when e every record started. It's also the time when Autotune came out, right. you know, 97. So um, records really changed during that time. Yeah. Um, sonically, musically, mm -hmm. you know, everything was a little tighter. Everything was a little bit more in tune. Um, so I think the, the process, uh, I mean, largely hasn't changed a whole lot. So th that was the last big thing that changed to me. You know, I'm, there's plugins, there's all this stuff that's great, you know, amp sims, all that stuff these days that people are using. But the last big change was about 20 years ago when, when that really all sort of, uh, you know, yeah. changed over. But uh, It's like a paradigm shift. It, like it is. There's and, and, a before and after. Big it's time. Like BC and you 80. listen to any record from that time <laughs> yeah. before and after, it's like, it's obviously like, whoa, like, you know, oh, this guy obviously, you know, discovered Pro Tools at that time in his right, career. Right. Because everything before then sounded kind of dumpy and messy and whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think... Um, a thing like Pro Tools uh, has made a lot of players sound like they're really good, and maybe in a live situation hasn't helped them a whole lot. Sure. Um, I like to pride myself on the fact that a lot of people who listen to stuff that I've done, they notice when the band sounds better in a live situation afterwards. Right. Which means the band understood what I did with them, you know, yeah. and, 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 and I don't sugarcoat stuff. If someone's having an issue with something, I'll, I'll let them know that I'm going to fix it, correct it. You know, I don't, I don't lie to them. You know, maybe in the early days of Pro Tools, we did a little bit of that to try to not hurt someone's feelings. Um, but replacing a drummer, uh, that, that to me, that's the ultimate hurt. Yeah. You know, if the guy shows up for a session and there's another guy playing his part. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah, you bring up an interesting point about the effect of Pro Tools on <clears throat> not just the sound of music, but how it's affected the band's live performance. Mm. And I don't know, I'm, a, I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm an observer here. I'm not a producer, but my sense of it is. Yeah, when Pro Tools came in, it was like, wow, we can just quantize everything, chop it all up, yeah. especially with drumming, just it's like spot on perfect. But then you get it, but I think there was a there was a bit of a learning curve yeah, there absolutely. for bands where just like with reverb. When they got into the live environment, yep. they were like, We can't reproduce this. And I feel maybe I don't know what the time span is, it, in the last ten to fifteen years, we're maybe getting back to a little bit more of a happier place where it's like the sounds that the bands are creating and the performances they're thinking about, we have to be able to do this live. Yeah. I mean, what's your sense of that, Derek? Uh, yeah, I, th I think uh, when the band's making the record, obviously, you know, if, if there's a, say, the drummer, for example, say yeah. the drummer's the weak link in the band, he doesn't have the best timing, the best feel, Pro Tools can help that. But I think 
it also helps him because he gets to hear it, how his drum should sound right. over and over again. Yeah. Right. He practices that way right. and becomes a better drummer. Because right, of that. Mm -hmm. right. For it becomes a, a, tool, a learning tool. Yeah, it becomes yeah. a learning tool. Interesting. But, you know, so. And what's your sense on the before Pro Tools and after? I mean, this is the great... I, this I, is the great debate, right? I still record the same, man. It's just to me, it's just a medium. Yeah. So like I, you know, I still use 57s and 421s and multiple right. uh, cabinets when I record guitars. You know, I still use a 57 on the snare. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, FET on the outside kick. You know, I have I have kick samples that I and snare samples and stuff that I use with yeah. the drums that I will always use. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, my go-to guys, I call them. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's just. Uh, technology has helped a little bit, but I don't, it hasn't changed the way I record. Right. So right. I still, I just have more tracks to do it. Right. Whereas, uh, you know, uh, the first, first metal album I ever made was Sac this band Sacrifice. And uh, we did Heard of them. Heard of them. Urban may have heard Natty. of them. <laughs> yeah, Love Rob Urbanati, Joe Rico, great yeah. guys. Uh, and we did it a whole on uh, 24 track, two inch tape. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we did it in two weeks. And yeah. You know, I, I think if I, I think if I had to redo that album now with those guys, it would still take two weeks. Right. And we'd do it the exact That's same. That's an interesting so. point. It's like you know, the tools are always going to change, right? Mm -hmm. Like the mm -hmm. technology change, the technology is going to change. Mm -hmm. We have no control over that. Um, there's always going to be, you know, companies developing new gimmicks and new gadgets and new things to make A lot of it's rehashed, though, if, easier you, if you really better. look at it. Like right, it's like a new right. plugin comes out, but it already came out 20 years ago. Right. It's well, that's because there's a, there's a new group of yeah, uh, fans right. that have that's never right. heard Just it before a new and think it's a brand it. new it. thing, right? Round and round we go. <laughs> but I guess back to your point, uh, Eric, it seems as though there's something at the heart of this that's never going to change. Yeah. No. And yeah. that is what? Understanding what's... What sounds good? Yeah, I mean, good exactly. music is good music. Performance and, yeah. and performance. performance and yeah. like knowing a push from a pull and where yeah. a guy's laid or, right. or if his vocal's not jiving with the with the with the band track. Yeah, no you matter know? how yeah. much technology we can just we move throw it now. It. That's the only difference. The human element is still yeah. has yeah. to be there. Yeah, you, yeah, still, you still need yeah. someone going. That was awesome. Yeah. Right, right. And that's the producer. Or that that's was the job. Or because how about that's you that being again? a therapist, yeah, exactly. too, by the way. Yeah. That was awesome. Or how about you try that again? Yeah. That was good. Let's do that Musicians again. Musicians can be a little yeah. bit sensitive. Yeah. Well, very I think sensitive. you can be very diplomatic sensitive. about things, you know, yeah. and I generally try to be. I'm not one of those, like, there's a lot of guys that are rude about things, and, you know, that fucking sucked, man. Well, uh, that was not your best shit I've ever heard. Like, there's nice ways to say that. Who are you, Michael you know? Beinhorn? <laughs> oh, no, no. Just kidding, Michael. Just kidding. <laughs> You know. I don't think he's the only one that communicated <laughs> that way. No, and I think, like, I, I know Ross Robinson does crazy shit, yeah. like throw fucking plants at, like, people's yeah. heads. And, yeah, right. You know, I mean, I just... The uh, method producers yeah. of the world. Well, yeah. everyone's yeah. got their thing, right? Sure. So that's what makes us, you know. So, sure. But, but I think going back to, like, what you were saying, mm -hmm. I think a lot of the bands in the last 15 years, because of Pro Tools and because of the technology, they've decided they need to play to a click live. Mm -hmm. And by doing so, they can run tracks and they can have all these other elements that they're not able to play as a band playing through the PA mm -hmm. and they sound so much better as a result, you know? But then, you, you know, you watch Zach Wild when he does the Aussie thing that he, when he plays and it's a three piece, there's no click, they just play together and it sounds fucking gigantic. Fuck yeah, live at Budokan you with, know? with Zach Wild and yeah. Mike Borden and Rob Trujillo. Like you I don't can't, know you know, and then, and then you do hear crazy. the bands that do tracks and yeah. it sounds smaller somehow, even though yeah, right. they're tighter, everything sounds perfect and there's yeah. all these yeah. synth tracks and yeah. things happen and shakers and tambourines and all these percussion things. Yeah. And, but that doesn't sound as big. All right. You know? I knew I knew as soon as we got to tambourines, <laughs> we we're going to have to refocus the conversation yeah. back to metal because that's why we're here. Uh, this has been a great conversation. I, I really enjoyed this. I wish uh, that we could do more of this uh, on the channel because I think sound is very important to this music that we love. Uh, we're going to wrap this up soon, but I'm not going to let you off the hook that mm -mm. easy, okay? So earlier we each kind of touched on a favorite metal album production-wise from our past. We had Power Slave, we had Master of Puppets, uh, I had Rain and Blood. I want to hear, uh, f first of all, from you, Sig, what's another standout <sighs> heavy record uh, that, that you want to bring attention to? I guess I'm going to have to say Super Unknown by Soundgarden. Yeah. You know, because, I mean, even though people might debate whether that's really a metal record or a hard rock record or whatever it happens to be, uh, it really was a, a, a pinnacle shift yeah, you know, musically, and a lot of bands were influenced by it at the time, mm -hmm. and and Soundgarden wasn't really around much longer even after that. They nope. put one more record out That's after right. that, and I think they kind of called it yep. until they sort of came back afterwards. Yep. But uh, 
It is an amazing. Yeah. It is an amazing sound. Yeah, record. sonically too. I mean, you Super listen to the huge. snare on that thing, and like nothing sounded like it. And it, and yep. it, and and even for me, I mean, I was 16 years old when that came out. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, th that sh shaped me too. You know, yep. maybe it was a generational thing or an era thing for me. And a lot of this stuff, when we think back of records that that changed us, they're nostalgic. Mm -hmm. You know, something was happening in our time, in our life at that time that you know we look back fondly mm -hmm. you know so i think that's a huge part of it of course too but for sure. but i mean that record just sounds amazing so for sure yeah for you i got two an old school mm. one and sort of a new school one but uh, uh never mind uh, yep. nirvana yeah like it, it really brought guitars back right from a from a place that was it seemed like they've been forgotten and the other one for me is uh blizzard of oz man oh yeah so first time i ever heard crazy train i was like yeah yeah those what are, the yeah, fuck Randy's is that? Guitar is like, come amazing. on, man. The best thing I've ever Certainly compared yeah. to the sound of guitar on the Sabbath records, yes, right? Like, yeah, it was sure, a yeah. real, that was a whole different, yeah. it had that 80s kind of like it, razor cut, yeah, kind yeah, of. Yeah, feel yeah the cut to it, was yeah. amazing. And I think it was mostly the playing. Like, that riff is undeniably 100%. one of the best well, riffs it ever. It opens up yeah. with I Don't yeah, Know. Man. Like, and come yeah, on. Dah, come dah, on. Dah, 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 dah. Yeah. What year is that record? Is that 81? I think it's 81, isn't it? 82? 82, I think. So, I mean, I wasn't 80. even... 80. 80. 80. So I wasn't even in this country. I was three oh, wow. years old. So Blizzard of Oz was 1980. Yeah, I think was it, it was 1980? I was I think 10 years old. Yeah. Yeah, when I heard that record. Was it 1980? I think it was it's, 1980. It's 80 or 81. It definitely is in that yeah, area. I was still you know? in public school. Like, I was yeah. still in, I wasn't in high school yet, I remember. Yeah. I heard it much like, later, so as I was older, I heard it. And, but it was still, I had the same feeling. Yeah, my, my only criticism of that record, kind of a weird bass tone. Yeah. They done Didn't they redo better. that it, record, it, though, uh, like well, years Rudy later? Sarzo, man. Do, do, yeah. do, do, well, I mean, there's some good lines in yeah. there, but... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Rudy Sarzo, and, and I don't even know if he, I don't know if he played on it or not. Maybe, I think he did. Yeah. But, uh... Um, or was he on? Was, was that him Sarzo on was on. Was, yes. He was on Diary of a Madman too. He was. Yep, yeah, he was exactly. actually in the back cover on that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I don't know if he was. I, I don't know if he was in the band and they just credited him with being bass, or if someone else actually played right. bass. But who cares about but bass? But who cares? We care. We care about, about bass. bass. <laughs> okay. It's so, the bottom uh, end. You know, I'm gonna one up you. I'm gonna go with three. Why? Ooh. Because I'm a host Damn and it. I'm an asshole, and I get to do that. One is. Uh, the best sounding metal album that has never been made is Anjustice for Newstead. Because we uh, talked yeah, about it yeah, earlier. Absolutely. If you ever got the opportunity to go mm. online, you can find it. It's kind of buried out there. But man, hear that record with Newstead's bass because I've always loved Newstead as a bass player. And mm. I think he brought a lot more to Metallica than what he often gets credited for. Yep. And I think Anjustice for All with the bass notched up it's notched up a little louder than what it really should be mm. so you can hear good. it but man it gives the whole album a whole other uh complexion uh i can't, i gotta mention I, i'll bring you know i'll be the more modern metal guy here at the gate slaughter of the soul mm. in 1995 for me was such a phenomenal record for many reasons but one the sound of it was it had this old school death metal production and yet this band was actually taking a part of death metal and a little bit of Iron Maiden and creating something totally new. And it was like heavy metal to the HM2 pedal with just everything <laughs> cranked up and playing out of a PV. And the guitar tone on that album is uh, so amazing. Lastly, um, I gotta mention Crack the Sky. I mm, think uh, yeah. it's, you know, obviously probably Mastodon's crowning achievement. Brendan O'Brien did an amazing sound, uh, job on that record. It's got that conceptual vibe and it's where I feel Mastodon started to add like you've got a little bit of a triangle over yeah. here and there's a tambourine over here yeah. and they really started to think about the sound of the band in a much bigger no boundaries. Uh, scope. There's yeah. a banjo over here. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Phenomenal. On the note of a banjo, Sig, pleasure. Thank you so much. Eric, thanks for your time. Damn, awesome. That man. was fun. We'll do it again. Thanks for joining us on Lockhorn's Redux. See you soon. Yeah!